want to bring a word of hope to our world right now. We want to tell people a story that will help them understand their own story. That's why we're going to walk through the book of Exodus. In this sermon, we want to see and consider what if we are the answer to our prayers? What if God is using us to serve others and to meet their needs? We'll be looking at Exodus chapter 3. For more information about Mount Lebanon or to listen to more audio or video content, check out our website, themountmke.org. We're going to be walking into the book of Exodus chapter two, chapter 3 today, kind of flying over a bunch of chapters in a general way. I want to invite you to grab your Bibles, um, and you can follow along. We'll be in, gen, in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, Pastor Krieger mentioned that as we began our time together this morning. Would you pray with me as we begin? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you today separated by time and space, uh, separated by a screen, uh, and yet not separated from you. Together we come into your presence, God, because you are not limited by time and space. You are with us wherever we are, and we are with you, Father, in the one true faith. We are with you and your Son and your Holy Spirit, all part of this holy Christian church. Lord God, we we pray, come to us today by your Holy Spirit and encourage us in our callings as your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, as we began kind of our walk into the book of Exodus, I I, I made the point, and and God showed it to us, that, that God is up to something. Even in what seemed to be really difficult and hard things, God is always up to something. But that always seems to leave, at least in my own heart and mind, it always seems to beg the question, well, then what is it? And, and not only what is it, but, but when is it going to happen? If God is up to something, what is he going to do and when is he going to do it? With those two questions in mind, I want to help you to imagine what it was like for the children of Israel. If you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 1, the Pharaoh came and put them into oppressive slavery. They they cried out to God. Now follow the life of Moses because it helps us to get a little bit of a timeline for the beginning to the end. Moses was, was born at the time when the Pharaoh said every boy must be thrown into the river Nile. Moses was spared. He grew up in Pharaoh's house. He lived in Pharaoh's house for 40 years. Then, follow the timeline, then Moses ran away because he killed an Egyptian and Pharaoh was mad at him. He ran away to Midian. Moses was a shepherd in Midian for 40 years. So now if you start to put a timeline together in your own mind, from Exodus chapter 1 to Exodus chapter 3, we've covered 80 years. So to put this into perspective, if if one of my kids, we'll pick on Ella, if if one of my kids was born, Ella's, how old is Ella, 14? (laughs) She doesn't know. She's 14. If Ella starts crying out to God for deliverance today, 40 years from now, my math isn't very good, 80 years from now, she'll be 94, right? Okay, good. My math is okay. She'll be 94 years old. So just imagine she's been praying and praying and praying and praying. She's gotten married. She's had kids. She's got grandkids. Maybe she's even got great grandkids. This whole time she's been praying and praying and praying. She knows and trusts that God is up to something, but this whole time she's been waiting and then there's nothing. And what you begin to see as we walk into Exodus chapter 3 today is that God is up to something even if you can't see it. Even if 80 years or 90 years or your lifespan passes and you never see how God fulfilled, how God was involved and what God was up to, even if you never see what God was up to, I want you to see this from Exodus chapter 3 that God truly is up to something. 
I want to read to you from Exodus chapter 3, the first 12 verses. Now Moses, he's, he's about 80 years old, we're told. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why this bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the, that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, so now... Go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. This is the word of our God. You know, I don't think that Moses thought that he'd ever go back to Egypt. The truth of the matter is, as you get to know Moses, even as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, he never actually embraced Egypt. You read the book of Hebrews and it says that, that Moses refused to be known as a son of Egypt. He, he, he didn't embrace those things. He chose to be mistreated rather to, than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of Egypt. So when Moses ran away to Midian and made a life as a shepherd over sheep in the desert there, I, I don't think that Moses ever thought that he was going to go back to Egypt. And yet, as I think about Moses at that place, I don't think that his prayers ever left Egypt. I don't think that Moses ever stopped praying about his people. Because his people were not the Egyptians, his people were his family. Aaron, his sister Miriam, the people of Israel, who were being mistreated and enslaved there. So on the one hand, I don't think that Moses ever thought that he would go back. But on the other hand, I don't think his prayers ever left Egypt so do you see what God did as Moses prayed for his people? Moses became the answer to his own prayer. It, it was God there on the mountain. That's why Moses had to take off his shoes. That's why he had to take off his sandals, because God, the almighty, the all-powerful, the holy Mighty God came to Moses there on the mountain and, and Moses knew that he was standing on holy ground so he had to take off his shoes and hide because who was he next to the almighty, all-holy God? And, and then God, this God came to Moses, our God came to Moses and said, Moses, I have a job for you. I saw my people. I've come to do something and Moses, you're the guy. I want you to go and lead my people out of Egypt. So here's my question for you today. It's the second fill-in if you're following along. What if you are the answer to your own prayers? 
I, I don't know exactly what it is that you're praying about right now, but, but these are some of the things that I'm praying about. I, I'm praying about the need that people have right now, today. I, I'm praying about the danger that people are in right now, today. I, I'm praying about the people who now, now really safer at home, can't leave their houses, are, are left with their own thoughts, and those thoughts take them to places that are not such happy places. I, I'm thinking about, I'm praying for, and maybe you are too, praying for people who are scared about the future. I'm, I'm praying for people who may need because they, they're not working or they can't work, who are overwhelmed by the responsibilities now of taking care of their kids and working now from home. W what if you're the answer to the, your prayers as you pray for them? Now, I don't, I don't know if you've gotten to read Martin Luther's letter about the pandemic and what we should do, what he thought they should do about it in the face of the plague. But he says two things to us about loving our neighbor at a time like this. He says, one, I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to stay away. Because, because out of love for my neighbor, I don't want to put them in a position where they're at risk. And so for them, I'm going to stay away. But then he also said, but if my neighbor needs me, then I'm going to go. Then I'm going to go and serve my neighbor. What if you are the answer to your prayers for the people who are in need right now? And, and I've already begun, maybe you've begun to think and pray about this too, about what's coming in a month or two. Now, I don't know what the future will bring, but I'm concerned about the people who are out of work now and what that will look like in a couple of months, about the businesses who don't have their income, about the need that already low-income families have, which will only perhaps grow as time progresses. What if you, or what if we, as a family of believers, are the way that God can begin to meet some of those needs for the people who have them? You see what God says to us in so many ways today? Now, go. I am sending you. And I can't walk through this without thinking about the spiritual need that people have. Because when there is physical need and when there is anxiety and when there is worry, there's a spiritual need there too. To turn to God. And how, dear people of God, will that need be met except that you and I tell them somehow, some way? The, the bummer of this time is that we can't invite people to come to church with us. But here's the opportunity that you and I have. With our own mouths and with our own voices, we can share the thing that gives us hope at this time. We can share the truth of God's word. What if you are the answer to your prayers for bringing hope from God, from his word, to people who desperately need it right now? Now, go. I am sending you. You know what's surprising about this whole exchange it is that Moses dares to say no. If, if you read on from chapter 3, we just read about one, one of them, but if you read on from chapter 3, he, he makes five excuses. And God keeps coming back, and God keeps coming back and saying, Moses, I've got you. Here's the plan. I'm going to give you help. Moses, I want you to do this. Moses keeps making excuses. And just like Moses, I don't know about you, but I've got all the excuses. What, what are yours? What are, what are the excuses that you give in your own heart for why you can't meet the need spiritually or perhaps physically that other people need? 
Could it be that you're afraid that if you give it away, you won't have it for yourself? Could it be that you're afraid that if you reach out to serve, you might get sick? Could it be that when it comes to spiritual things, you don't feel like you have the right words? Or what if they ask me a hard question? No, I wonder how many non-Christians are asking questions right now about what is God up to? How can a good God let these things happen? And maybe you don't, you're not sure about the answer to that. You don't know what to say if someone asks you that question. You know the Romans 8.28, but you're afraid of what you need to say next. And just like Moses, we have all the excuses. But I want you to see this about God. We only get a glimpse of it in the 12 verses we looked at here. But but I want you to see this with with God. As God the Father comes to his child Moses and says, Now go. Moses said, I can't. And God said this to him, verse 12, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God is patient with Moses beyond measure. You know, when I ask my kids to do something and they say no, I'm right away, I'm done. There's, there's not a, but dad, there's not a, there's, when there's a but dad, there's, there's never a whole lot of patience. But do you see God, who had this monumental task for Moses to take on, five times, read chapters three and four, five times Moses came to God and said, but God, And five times, God came back to Moses and said, No, Moses, I want you to do it. And I'm going to give you a sign that I will be with you. I'm going to give you support and strength to you along the way. Moses, you will not be alone. Notice the patience of God. Notice the promise of God. We're going to look at this more next Wednesday, the signs that God gives Moses. But I want you to see this here already now in verse 12. This will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God is saying to Moses, Moses, I want to show you something. When you go back and you do what I've sent, uh, what, what I've sent you to do, you're going to come back right here to this place and you are going to worship me right here on this mountain. Dear people of God, the same God who said to Moses, I am with you and this will be the sign of my presence with you, has said that to you today. By his word, God is with you. You may be sitting in your living room or at your dining room table. You may be listening to this at your desk at work. You may be watching this any number of different places. But God says to you, in my word, that is where I am to be found. God promises you, I am with you through my word. So if you want to know where God is, God promises to be found right here in his word. And more than that, remember the promise of Jesus who says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So do you see what God has done and what God does in Moses and what then God does in us? Here's the final part. God makes the unwilling heart willing to serve him. I want to step away from this text in a way and say that is what God has done for you already. When when your father brought you to faith through baptism, when God your father brought you to faith through his word, God took a heart that was unwilling God took a heart, the Bible says, that was dead, a heart that was stone, a heart that was, Paul says to the Romans, it's a hostile heart. God took a heart that was unwilling and he changed that heart and made it new. And the miracle of God changing your heart is no less miraculous than when God called Lazarus out of that tomb. 
Because when God called you through your baptism and when God calls you through his word, it is just as powerful a voice as when God, Jesus called Lazarus, Lazarus, come out! And what did, you heard it a little bit ago. What did Lazarus do? He came out of that tomb alive. Through his word and through your baptism, God has called you to life and made your unwilling heart willing. And through that same word and by that same spirit, God continues to make your heart willing to serve you. I want to end this time with you in God's word with a prayer. A prayer to the Holy Spirit. That God's spirit would come to us, to our our dead dry bones that are sometimes unwilling to do what God calls us to do, that God would come to us and and make our bones alive, as he did in Ezekiel, That, that, that God would make us live again, that God would wash our sins away, and that God would set us on fire by his Holy Spirit to serve him in a wise and yet compassionate way. Would you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Come into our hearts and wash our sins away. Come, Holy Spirit, into our hearts and give us eyes. Give us eyes to see people around us who need our love, who need our compassion. Give us ears to hear, ears to listen to the hearts of people, ears to listen to their concerns and their cares. Give us mouths then, Holy Spirit. Give us mouths then to speak about your love and your truth and your promises to hearts that are hurting. Give us feet to go and hands to serve. Come, Holy Spirit, and make us alive again. Make us alive again this day to serve you and everyone that we meet with all the wisdom and all the strength that you provide. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time of grace. And we ask you to bless us in in all our places where we are. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.